Good morning. Back in late uh, 2003, I was a new assistant professor, very nervous, uh, beginning, uh, beginning an academic career. And my routine was to try to wake up as early as possible in the morning uh, and put as many hours as possible into my research group and th get things off the ground. The team of what uh, we were working on back then was to miniaturize devices. So we wanted to make really small electronics. We wanted to make really small sensors. And the other thing that we were talk, uh, thinking about and talking about was how to integrate these uh, small devices onto unconventional places. How would I put them into paper? Or how, how would I uh, make glass functional? So imagine this nervous uh, new assistant professor waking up every morning uh, to the tune of NPR, so 5 a.m. or 6 a.m., blindly trying to find his way towards uh, his box of contact lenses, put the contact lenses on, and start the day. So I had this always in my mind of how to make small things, how to put these small things into new places. And every morning, I was staring at this piece of uh, plastic at the tip of my, uh, tip of my finger. Uh, it was natural that after a while, I put the two together and I wondered, what happens if we put these tiny devices on a contact lens? What would that enable? And that got us uh, started on a pretty interesting journey that took, it took some time of exploring what happens if you turn your contact lenses to a platform. So what uh, our uh, research group does at the University of Washington is to look at uh, two possibilities for turning contact lenses into systems. One is for uh, using them for wireless sensing, and the other one is for information display. I'd like to take the next few minutes, tell you what these applications are, and the last part of my presentation would be a progress report of what is it that uh, we've done to at least try to make these, these things real. Now let's talk about wireless sensing for, for a second. And this takes me to a doctor's office. So what happens when we feel discomfort, when we feel um, ill? We walk to a doctor's office, uh, and the physician would look at us. And the first things that they would do is perhaps to look at our face, see if it looks okay or not, color. Uh, they may take our pulse. They may take our temperature. So they would do some physical uh, parameter measurement. But that takes us only so far. The next thing they would do is to uh, probably prescribe a blood test. So they want to know what happens in the chemistry of the body if the analytes are okay, if there's, uh, there's an infection uh, present. So we know that the way our medicine works is uh, not just based on physical parameters. We need to monitor the chemistry of the, of the body somehow. But you notice actually there's a problem here, and that is we don't do this very often. Actually, for many of us, we may go years after years without testing what happens in our, in our body at all. We need tools if we really want to understand uh, how our bodies work and improve, uh, uh, improve medicine. We need tools that would allow us to monitor the body continuously and take many snapshots of what happens inside. Now, these tools uh, could be either outside of the body, but we know the limitations of those tools, that they don't have a chemical interface with the body. Or they could be inside, they could be implants, and there are many examples of successful implants. But uh, unfortunately, body always reacts to these implants, and it's very difficult to maintain a chemical interface. So as of today, we don't really have a tool that would allow any of us here to monitor continuously and non-invasively what happens inside our body. If we can enable that tool, I think we have access to a new type of medical information, and hopefully, based on that, we can improve, improve medicine. So we want to make this tool, and we looked at the surface of the eye, and it's astonishing, actually, what happens on the surface. So it's not inside the body, it's not outside of the body, it's on the surface of the body. And it turns out that many things that show up in our bloodstreams also show up uh, in the tear fluid. So they are present on the surface of the eye. Now, for the most part, we don't know what those correlations are. So we know glucose, for example, present, is present on the surface of the eye. We know glucose is present. Uh, in the blood, and we know that we need to monitor that if uh, someone has diabetes. But what the correlations exactly are, we don't, uh, we don't know for the, most, uh, for the most part for most of these parameters. But this is uh, a very, very promising interface uh, for monitoring the body. If I could make a contact lens, and many of you in this crowd probably wear contact lenses, 125 million people actually wear them on a daily basis, and they have been wearing them for decades. If you could make a contact lens that you could wear similar to a normal contact lens, and this lens would monitor the surface of the eye 
um, do perhaps a basic chemical analysis and radio out the results, you might have a tool that would allow us access to fundamentally new types of uh, information, um, medical information. And our hope is to build these tools and use this information to expand medical knowledge and uh, perhaps this expanded medical knowledge someday can result in new therapies. So there are known conditions uh, such as diabetes that we know that we have to continuously monitor the glucose level and our hope is to, uh, to expand this body of knowledge. So these could be very, very interesting tools for healthcare. Another area that uh, uh, makes us really excited about uh, contact lenses is putting displays on the contact lenses. And this is about the contact lens, again, that you can wear similar to a normal contact lens with the added benefit that it has a display of sorts. So you could wear it around, and this display has a wireless link perhaps to your cell phone, and the cell phone talks to the cell phone tower, so you have data connectivity, and the contact lens can show you images, various types of information, and we can talk, uh, talk later on of what these types of information could be. Depending on the sophistication of this display, you may use it for very basic things, or gaming, or get, getting alerts, or someday, if you can make this very sophisticated, and this is far into the future, actually, you may enable augmented reality. So what is, uh, what is augmented reality? Augmented reality is a field that's quite active right now in computer science, and is about uh, putting an extra layer of digital information onto what you would normally see. So imagine you walking uh, in the old town in Lyon, so the picture actually um, I took a few, few years ago, and you, you're wearing a device, could be in the form of a contact lens, that could sense actually what you're seeing at, and at the same time process data and put some extra information on this. So we're not entirely actually altering what you see, but we partially alter what you see to give you extra information about your environment or just tweak it. Uh, and um, uh, give you a new sense of uh, what your environment might, might be. So something like this is very, very complicated to make, and we're not nowhere near actually implementing these on contact lenses, but the promise uh, is there. And the last thing I wanted to say about the applications of the display is that if we think about how we use displays today, so throughout the day we may use displays in a car dashboard, we may use displays as billboards, we may use a smartphone display, we may use a laptop, we may use a desktop computer, we may use TVs. There's lots of displays that we interact with. But if you take a step back and see what those displays do, basically what they do is that they put an image on your retina. So fundamentally, we don't need all these displays. All we need is a device to put an image on our retina. And perhaps this could be implemented in the form of a contact lens. So you can have just one universal display that you wear, so that's your display, that's your contact lens or glass or whatever it, format it takes, and we can get rid of all the other displays that we use today. And that really will significantly uh, shrink the size of electronics and mobile devices. Now these are pretty interesting, interesting areas, the healthcare applications and the display applications of contact lenses, but is any of this possible, is it real? And if you list actually all you need to do to enable these sophisticated systems, unfortunately this list uh, uh, appears to be pretty daunting. The technology development appears to be pretty daunting. We need to make antennas, radios, extremely miniaturized systems, extremely low power systems, integrate all these uh, onto a contact lens, make sure they operate uh, wirelessly, make sure it's safe, make sure they create images. Very, very difficult. So I want to take the next next few minutes and give you a progress report of uh, what is it that we have done in our research group to at least move towards these goals. And uh, the disclaimer is that we have not really been able to completely uh, solve these problems, but at least we've made some good progress. Now let's look at, uh, look at the parts that we need and the techniques that we need to build these contact lenses. We need extremely small circuits. For example, we need extremely small radios that would uh, fit on a contact lens. And it turns out that progress of the semiconductor industry in the past few decades has really enabled us to make a circuitry that's extremely small. So what you see on this uh, screen is an actual radio made in our group that um, is actually comparable to the cross section of the human hair. And this has lots of transistors and it's a nice functional radio. So the state of the art today in the semiconductor industry enables us to make electronic circuits radios that are extremely tiny. Related to that, the recent progress in nanotechnology, past perhaps 10 years, 
has enabled the construction of sensors, uh, things that can look at the molecule, for example, and report electronically what they've seen, has enabled the construction of sensors that are extremely small. So this graph is almost to scale, and today we can make sensors that are smaller than a single cell, that even fit inside a single cell. So we can make these very, very tiny components that can interact with nature or report back what they see. Uh, so in our group, we've developed basically techniques for making these small devices, and here's another example of a photo detector uh, collection. Um, what you see uh, on the upper left, uh, left corner of the slide is a solution uh, that appears to uh, contain maybe some powder or pepper, but it really isn't a chemical. Actually, if you put this under a microscope, these are individual photodetectors so that it can detect light and create an electronic signal that have specific shapes, specific geometries, and specific connections. So we can actually make these tiny, tiny components. And related to that, actually, we have, over the years, developed techniques to place these components in the right place. So here you see an example. This is based on self-assembly, so we don't put these components one by one by a robot that we just program them to go to the right location. Over the years, through self-assembly, we've developed techniques that would allow us to put these tiny components onto flexible plastic and other substrates. So now, having the components and having these techniques would allow us to make uh, very interesting contact lenses. Here are a couple, a couple of examples. These are just mock-ups, actually, that these particular contact lenses don't, don't do much. They just have electrical connections for circuits. But you can see that the ability, the, the access to technology can allow us to create very interesting systems. So very quick, actually, what is it that we have accomplished in the, in the medical uh, part? Uh, this is still work in progress, but what you see here is an example of a contact lens which has a glucose sensor. It has antenna and has a small radio. So what this does is that we can power this up by sending radio waves. It would, act, it would wake up, it would activate, it would measure the glucose in the environment, and it would radio out the results uh, back to the, to the transmitter. So this is what we can do today. This is uh, just actually got accepted uh, for publication. Uh, this works in a beaker on a lab bench. Uh, we don't know how this device is going to work, uh, work on an animal, but this is experiment in progress. So one thing I wanted to, uh, one point I wanted to make about these devices is that this looks like a very busy slide, I apologize, but there's one point about these systems, and that is the progress of the semiconductor industry has enabled us to operate these systems with minuscule amounts of power. So this whole system works with uh, three microwatts. And these powers were considered noise, essentially, a few years ago. So we just neglect this. But now that we can make systems that require exceedingly small power levels to operate, we can tap into sources of energy in the environment, in the nature, that previously we dismissed as noise. In this case, the system is completely RF powered. So we just send radio wave in, power the system, and uh, the system communicates with the radio uh, back to us. Related to that, actually, we have incorporated solar cells on contact lenses. So you could actually walk around and collect the light from the environment. Just the light on the stage is, uh, is plenty. And we can turn that light to usable power for our sensors, radios, and electronics. It's an actual uh, contact lens with solar cells uh, collecting uh, ambient, ambient energy. So this is what we can do today. Uh, Real quick about this place. So we've made some progress in the medical domain, far from being done, but I think uh, the progress at least is, is promising. For this place, um, one of the questions, the first questions that uh, come to mind is whether you can focus on a, on a display that's directly on the surface of your eyes. So if you extend your hand, uh, try to focus on your finger, as you bring your finger closer and closer to your eyes, you realize that your eyes cannot accommodate after a certain point, so the image becomes blurry. And whether you can create images directly on the surface of the eye uh, has been an open question for some time because we've never had a display that was that close to the eye. And it actually turns out that you could do that, but you need to incorporate more optical elements into your display. So it's not just a simple display anymore. Uh, so we've started to incorporate lots of different types of micro-optics on, on contact lenses. And this actually really excites me because Historically, when we go back, these, these spectacles were simple lenses. These are very simple optical components. But 
with what we have in nanotechnology and microtechnology, we can incorporate a lot more onto the surface of the eye and truly actually augment or alter and perhaps better people, uh, people's uh, vision. So these types of lenses actually um, help in creating an image um, on the surface of the eye. What you see in the lower right corner is a rabbit who's wearing a contact lens with lots of different tiny, tiny lenses. So we, we do test on rabbits, and so far everything that we have tested has been completely safe, so we've never harmed any animal. Uh, we've done simulations of how the images might look like from a contact lens that has a display and allows people to look out. Uh, so this is a computer simulation result. This is not from a real contact lens. But as you can see, and this happens to be, by the way, this picture is uh, taken in Michigan, so it's right next door. Uh, that's where I went to school, so very close affiliation to Midwest. Um, so as you can see, it's possible to see the normal scenery, but at the same time, uh, look at an image that's created by the contact lens. Here is the letter E shown in the image. Now, in terms of practically implementing these displays, we've taken very small steps uh, forward. Let me uh, quickly show you a small uh, movie. So what you see here is actually a contact lens from our lab, and this contact lens has a small radio, has antenna, and has a very small light source. Let me see if I can play it one more time. It may or may not play. There you go. Uh, so we can power this completely wirelessly from incoming radio waves and control that light source and turn it on and off. Uh, so right now we can do two colors. We can do blue or red. And um, fairly recently, we've been able to uh, turn on very simple text on contact lenses. So we can um, show this text on a contact lens, still not completely in focus. We have a long way to go, but we've taken, we've taken small steps uh, forward. Uh, to create a display that you can wear in the form of contact lenses. So I hope that if, uh, I have uh, convinced you that there is tremendous potential in turning contact lenses into, uh, into systems, either for displays or for uh, a medical application. And I would like to actually leave you with, uh, with one, one message. And this is, in addition to be a big thank you to all of my co collabor uh, collaborators, is the message that uh, I would hazard a guess that the era of uh, solo star scientists is probably over. If I look at what, uh, what we've done in our project, many people with many types of different expertise are involved for pushing this forward, from uh, medical doctors to material scientists to circuit designers uh, to chemists. And I think going forward, many of the advances uh, that we'll make in science and technology will be the result of uh, uh, groups of people working to the, together closely. Thank you very much.